You've just joined the Prepper Broadcasting Network, where we promote self-reliance and independence. The views and opinions expressed are strictly those of the host or their guests. Visit us in the interactive chat room at PrepperBroadcasting.com. Hello, folks. G-Man here with a Sun Oven Special. Over 50,000 preppers have discovered how to stretch their fuel shortage with Sun Oven. Boil, bake, or steam year-round. Sun Ovens cook freeze-dried food storage and can be used as a solar dehydrator or water purifier. For 28 years, durable Sun Ovens have been proudly made in the U.S. They have a long life and 100% satisfaction guarantee. Don't be fooled by cheap imitations. For a discount coupon, visit sunoven.com backslash preppers rate. Radio. That's www.sunoven.com backslash preppers radio. The world has changed. America has changed. If something were to happen tomorrow, how self-sufficient would you be? Could you grow your own food? Could you sustain your own livestock? Could you... Survive. This is the We Grow Our Show with Nick and Don. Nick and Don talk about everything from politics to planting. They cover techniques, methods, and tips on how to not only survive, but thrive. Visit the website at WeGrowHours.com. Lock and load. This is the We Grow Our Show. Get your grow on. Oh man, that hey, pumps hey. me up every time. I love that every intro. Time. Yep, every time, it, it never gets old. I actually go to sleep with that playing. It's awesome. <laughs> That's pretty sad, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I've got. Uh, I've, uh, I, I believe they call it a megalomaniac uh, syndrome. I really believe in myself a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he likes listening to himself talk. That's what it's about. And Nick, you're going to be talking about gasification, and who better than you? That's right. Uh, talk about your hot gases, right? I mean, that's uh, that's kind of my forte. And we're doing it live, so we're going to try and get through this whole thing without dropping any profanities. So, yeah, no hot garage <laughs> either, by the way. I don't have a yeah, no, this time. Yep. Uh, well, shoot from the hip, right? Absolutely. So let me start Go this ahead, off man. by saying I am not a, gro- a go-greenist. I don't believe that we should uh, shoot ourselves in the foot preserving the earth. That being said, I don't believe we should crap where we sleep. <laughs> Forgive the crudeness of the term, but, uh, you know, we need to take care of this planet. It's the only one we've got. And, uh, you know, you, you take care of yourself as well. So if you're going to go green, make sure that it saves you green. Uh, I preface that and then go on to tell you that, I am actually very cheap and somewhat lazy. Um, so my motivations behind searching out alternative fuels um, comes from that. I, uh, When I was about 16, actually before I was 16, I was about 12, my grandpa came in and was playing with a wheel that had a set of magnets on it. And... I don't remember the configuration to this day, but what I saw him do was take a refrigerator magnet, like the strip that holds your refrigerator shut. He cut it into identical pieces that were basically sitting in slots that were loose. And then he had a massive earth magnet on the edge of this wheel. And with just a slight little twitch of this earth magnet, that wheel fired up and was just going as fast as it could go. And it was crazy. This thing was running without electricity, was running without wind power or anything. It was just just a twitch of that magnet moving just slightly was causing that to pulse back and forth. I I was astounded. And I I'm pretty sure that that was the first the first um what do you call it? Uh inspiration to start looking for alternative energy. Uh, I, I started there and, and was playing with those magnets and, and my grandpa's, he, he's gone now. And I, there's so many things I wish I could have asked him about that project that he had, but, uh, 
but uh, that really sparked my interest in alternative fuels. When I was a little bit older, privilege of fueling up my truck for the first time, and it cost me about half of a day's pay uh, to fuel it up, and that really hurt. <laughs> so uh, that's when I became a cheap SOB. <laughs> Did you have a question, Don? Well, yeah, I, 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 a lot of questions, Nick. I mean, that that sounds like an amazing project, and I I want to learn more about that. So we've got to find out what he was doing. You got to teach me that. But <laughs> get, uh, we're not just talking about energy because I mean I agree with you. I'm cheap too, and uh-huh. we're talking about energy to go off grid. We're talking about energy when there isn't any energy available, and you can't just plug that you know, your iPhone into the into the outlet and let it charge, you know, and I don't have solar right now, so what else do you do? And I think it's kind of neat because you're talking about things that we can use right now that you can go out and build in your garage for the most part and run a lawnmower or a generator. And, you know, we, we've talked about solar on, on some past episodes. So I'm really curious as to, you know, kind of what you're doing. And I know you're not a greenie and you don't want to save the earth, I've got a lot of questions about that, too, because I'm, I have the same philosophy. You don't poop where you eat, um, or sleep, I should say. <laughs> uh, so what, what, does it pollute even more or less than, you know, than other things by burning, you know, wood or, or in our case, rabbit poop, which I know you're big into gasifying? Okay, so you, you're going right into gasification. Well, that's, I, um, I, I, all the energy sources. I mean, gasification is, is what I'm really interested in because I've got a generator sitting here, and if something happens, I've got no solar to speak of other than on my aquaponics system. So I know I can, I can keep my pumps going, but I want to keep my refrigerator going and my air conditioner going. And I know my generator, when I run out of fuel, I want to be able to continue to live and, and have some lights at night, and I want to be able to have my refrigerator and my frozen rabbit sitting there, and I don't want everything defrosting. So that's really where I want to go and what I want to learn about. So, tell, tell, let, yeah, let's dive right into gasification. And before we do that, let me rem- remember that you guys can call in live, too. We, we're, we'll take questions. We're doing our first live show, so if anybody wants to call in, feel free to do that. That's right. Do you want me to give the number? Yeah. It is one three four seven. Two zero two zero two two eight. So if you've got a question about this while we while we get going, go ahead and call in and uh, and uh, let us have it. Um, so gasification. Now the reason I've given a little bit of story behind this is because I actually was making gunpowder one day, and uh, this was back in my pyro days as a teenager. Uh, I'd followed some instructions to to put take a paint can, stuff it full of straw, poke a hole in the lid, and close it up, and then put it in a fire. And this is something that I had seen done with pine needles in a, a Coke can out, out, uh, you know, out, in, the, out in the woods. But uh, I was actually doing it uh, with this paint can filled full of straw. And I was making the carbon for, uh, for the gunpowder. So I'm sitting here watching this fuel pouring out of uh out of the can because basically all of the hydrocarbons in the in the straw was being emitted out of this hole in the can and a little flame was sitting there there was it was about six inches off the can and I'm like man there's something in that that's burning and this is you know 14 15 year old kid that's just fascinated with fire and uh I didn't really understand it but I knew that there was something there that could be harnessed and I started playing around with it. I started doing this, doing that. Uh, I won't go into all of the details, but I spent five years looking for the reason that did that. And back then I wasn't much of a reader. <laughs> I uh, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble because by the time I hit 20, I had a pretty good system going using, using light materials going into it, uh, gasifying it basically. And I had no idea what I was doing exactly. I just knew that it was working. Well, then I get looking at it, and I had somebody come over and look at it. He's like, oh, yeah, you built a gasifier. I was like, well, what the heck's a gasifier? And he's like, well, it's a 1928 technology that they used in pre, 
uh, World War One Europe because there was a gas shortage and they used it again during World War Two. I'm like, are you kidding me? This technology is almost a hundred years old, and I'm sitting here reinventing the wheel. Um, so I was a little bit stressed out that I'd spent so much time doing that when I should have just researched it and figured it out. Um, so, what's that? Didn't know about Google yet. Well, I I mean I did, but everything I looked at it was I was looking for why it did that while making gunpowder, and that was a limited that was a limited field. I didn't know exactly what to ask, and there was other projects going on. It wasn't like it was five years straight of of research. Uh, but well, there let was. Me you, there, let me ask you this, Nick. If you you you're talking about a paint can and, and just that that little project that you did, and explain to me how that works because I I have no clue. You're putting pine needles in this thing. What else goes in it to make that flame? You've got to be adding more than just that, don't you? Yes. In fact, that's what I started with. But the real thing, or the real name of it, is gasification. And they started by using wood chips. Uh, wood chips was the the main feedstock. That they'd, they'd go out and they'd get a bunch of brush and stuff, and they'd stuff it in this gasifier, and... A little bit of it lights on fire, uh, causes combustion, and then it heats up the rest of the hydrocarbons, releases it, and pumps it into the internal combustion engine. Now, I don't know if we have um, the the pictures readily available here, um, but uh, the, I, I sent some some pictures over to the to the host. Uh, he's going to put up somewhere. Um, I believe he's going to link it to our page. But, yeah, we'll um, get them put up on the page too. Yeah, we'll we'll get them put up. But basically, uh, you've got a feedstock going into a canister that is surrounded by another canister. So the 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 internal cylinder is where you put in your feedstock. Now there's a small now, inlet feedstock, where. What do you mean by feedstock? You're talking about anything combustible, right? Yeah, any any dry biomass can go into this thing. Wood chips, okay. uh, sawdust pellets, and later in life, ga- I started gasifying rabbit manure because I had so much of it. In fact, that's actually one of the reasons I got into rabbits was for the pellets um, because they were a predictable um, density. So you've got this you've got this uh canister inside of a shroud basically it's it's a can inside of a can the inner can has your feedstock in it and there's an inlet that goes towards the combustion zone well first let me preface that with if you light a match there are four things that are happening every time that there's fire there are four things that happen first is obviously the the dehydration if you will You strike a match, that first initial heat causes pyrolysis. Uh, Pyrolysis is the thermal breakdown of matter. If you watch the match burn, the wood itself is not on fire, just the gases above it. Um, The gases are released from the wood, and then that lights on fire, and you're left with this hot carbon skeleton of what used to be the match. Well, that hot carbon is reducing Uh, oxygen off of ambient uh, water and CO2. So basically, gasification is controlling the four parts of flame. And those four parts are combustion, reduction, pyrolysis, and dehydration. So where you add water, or excuse me, where you add the air into a combustion zone, uh, you get that temperature up to about 1,200 degrees. It causes pyrolysis or thermal breakdown in the feedstock or the fuel around the combustion area, and that releases the hydrocarbons. Now, the hydrocarbons, when they're uh, when they're produced, they act a lot like propane or or methane, or di- different types of gaseous fuels, and uh, they really um, uh, they they really act a lot like propane, so you can compress it. Uh, some people say that it's it's not safe to compress, especially with uh, oxygen present. That's called making a bomb. You don't want to do that. Um, so as long as you're oxygen-free, you can compress it. Um, you have so, to compress it? 
No, you don't. But if you wanted to store it, you would. That's just That's if uh, if you want to store it. So, so let me see if I've got this right to this point. Now I'm gonna I want to design one of these. So basically, I'm taking a, a, a rocket stove. You know, all the preppers know what rocket stoves are, right? You take a rocket uh-huh. stove and I'm putting a can inside of it full of rabbit manure, and I'm taking a hose or a piece of metal out of that and bringing it into another canister and filling that up. Is that pretty much what I'm doing to store this? Kind of. Um, it it doesn't run on an external. I'm sorry, it doesn't run on an external heat source though. It it runs it it's basically self perpetuating. Man, I wish I could share a picture here. I see a solar prepper in the chat is sharing pictures of uh different gasification devices and I appreciate that. Um but let's uh let's see, how do I do that? <laughs> I, I know how to turn a screwdriver and weld, but when it comes to computers I'm not exactly getting her done, you know. Uh, I don't think there's a way that I can upload from my computer. I think you have to turn in links to it. But if there's there's a few different types of gasifiers, and if you Google image the the different types, you'll be able to find this out. So everybody that's at your computer, go ahead and type in Google uh, downdraft gasifier, and you'll get this pretty picture of what I'm looking at here. Um, and we'll we'll put this up on in the show notes on our page. And I believe there'll be some links to those are that are listening. Uh, but basically, you've got a steel hourglass that's inside of a cylinder, and at the at the middle of the hourglass, like right where the right where the throat is, where stuff would pass through, is where you allow air in at a controlled rate. And the more air you put in, the hotter your combustion is going to be, and the more fuel it's going to need to run that combustion but the faster you will produce your hydrocarbons. Now, there's a few different style gasifiers, but the one that I'm going to talk about is the downdraft gasifier because I believe it is the most efficient in the ones that you can build yourselves. So my uh, uh, my favorite one and the one that's my go-to is this downdraft gasifier. Um, you can build a a little butterfly valve on it that allows you to control the air inlet. In fact, when you get started, you use you use a pump, like an air pump that you'd use for filling up your uh, uh, inflatable bed or pool toys or whatever. Uh, you use that to get it going. And then once it gets up to the right heat, it will cause that thermal breakdown that we're talking about. Now, in the, in the downdraft gas fire, the upper area is just for dehydration. Well, the water that comes out of the drying zone and passes through the pyrolysis zone, then to the combustion zone, nothing happens because it's water. Uh, But once it hits the reduction zone, where all of the hot carbon is after the pyrolysis happens, because when you you release the hydrocarbons from uh, a biomass, all that you're left with is the carbon skeleton of what it used to be. And with that, you uh when you heat up carbon hot hot carbon will strip oxygen off of other molecules so if you pass co2 through the hot carbon area or the reduction zone it will strip off an oxygen molecule and give you carbon monoxide and when water passes through it it strips off oxygen and gives you h2 which is also a fuel um those two things combined with the uh the uh the syngas or the producer gas that came out of the the pyrolysis zone are then ducted out of the gasifier and into a cooler uh, and a filter. So in the, I'm sorry, what's that? That's pretty cool. (laughs) I I like that. So the, uh, from once it exits the, the gasifier, it goes into a cooler. Actually, there's a little bit of filtration that happens first. Um, there's a, something called the Venturi or a, a swirl filter where basically yeah. the hot gases go into a cylinder and shoot around the edges and it causes a, causes um, like the centripetal force to drop all of the big solid out of the, out of the gases and those go down into the bottom and you have like a jar there to collect it or a pipe that can get screw off. Um, 
and the, a lot of the tars that are produced will end up in there as well because uh, let's face it, sap and different types of really thick uh, soupy stuff that's in wood and in, in various products becomes a tar under heat. Um, and that tar you really don't want going into your engine because it can cause some issues. So you also don't want fly ash to go into your engine either, which if we look back at the picture of the, the gasifier, um, there's an area that they call the ash pit. Well, uh, you also need a shaker grate underneath your reduction zone. That'll keep the, that'll keep the hot carbon up and give you space between the hot carbon and the ash. Now that ash is, uh, mostly uh, fly ash, which is really high, uh, has a lot of lye in it, and is used in concrete for, uh, I believe, a catalyst for making it dry quickly. So that fly ash is a product that you want to keep. Now, you've got your product, which is a really hot, probably about 800 degrees at the exit point, uh, loaded full of... Uh, good hydrocarbons, there's no oxygen in it because it went through the reduction zone and it's ready to be uh, cleaned up and burnt. So we go to the uh, the filter. Uh, there's a number of ways to do it. The first filter that I built was just a, a metal five-gallon bucket loaded full of straw that I put a little bit of water in so it was it was cooling it a little bit uh, and it was pulling all of the pulling on the fly ash and the tar out of it, uh, that filled up pretty quick and you had to use a lot of straw. So instead of doing that, the next one that I built, I took a CO2 tank that had been hydroed and was no longer good from my welder, and I cut slits, um, alter, altering from one side to the other, and so it kind of looks like one of those wooden snakes that bend. I don't know if if anybody's seen those, but uh, it's like a notch on, on each side. And I went all the way down to the bottom with it, and I took perforated steel and stuck it into each one of the slits so that there was basically a kind of a serpentine-looking uh, path all the way through this cylinder. Welded those in place, made sure that they were airtight, and then sprayed water into the top of this steel and the gases out of the gasifier went into the bottom. So the hot gases rose up through the perforated steel uh, and were forced through the water that was being atomized and picking up all of the garbage. And I was able to pump the water through this thing repeatedly uh, to clean out any of the impurities. And it gave you some pretty nasty black water, but that could be easily filtered out, and you could harvest the things that were in the water. Uh, that did two what, things. What, what kind of things are going cool. in that water, Nick? That's so we like use your that, fly. We use that water for other things. Uh, yeah, actually, if you that water is what you would use. If, if anybody's ever made soap before, lye, L Y E, yes. is uh, the main not ingredient, but it's the it's the catalyst that helps you strip glycerins. And we won't get into the into some of the uses of the glycerins, but um, but for making soap, that's what you do. Uh, it's called well, leaching. Well, that's what my, my wife makes the goat soap. So you're saying I can get the lye out of this thing to make our soap and keep us exactly. clean. And at the same time, I can power a generator off of the gas yes. coming out after it's been compressed and fed back into something. Yes. And not only that, but you can use the hot gases that are going through this to heat the water that's in there and run that hot water into some sort of a radiator that would normally be hooked up to a boiler in old homes. And that radiator right. can be inside your house and be emitting heat uh, that uh, normally would have just gone to waste into the atmosphere. That energy that's emitted will save you on your, your heat bill. Now, one, one of the uh, old greenhouses that I was in, I was back in Pennsylvania doing a consult, and we had this old greenhouse, had a root cellar under it, and down there they had a gasification unit, and it also helped control the temperature in the greenhouse in the wintertime. So they had these big pipes that went through, and all the water ran through that. He called it a scrubber, and they were able to... Uh, generate power off of that greenhouse to to do some of the the things for the main house. This was built a long time ago, 
and, uh-huh. and an old plantation, and they used it to not only produce the power but to keep the temperature controlled in the greenhouse. So kind of same thing you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's it, anywhere that you're producing heat, I mean, you look at uh, – it, this goes for any generator. I'll get get back on that. Any generator or any engine running, your efficiency rating is about 20 to 30% of the fuel that's going into it is actually going towards thrust or work or actual joules being delivered to the uh, to your generator unit or your pump or anything. So anytime you're consuming fuel, you're losing energy through heat. And if you can duct the air over that heat source, you can uh, really maximize your energy use because you're gotcha. you're basically recycling it. So you want to go green, why don't you stop by giving away your energy? Right. So right. No, that's a and you know what? I think this is a good point Nick um because I wanted to then we're we're halfway through the show. I wanted to to get into other alternative energies and have you talk about some other things. And I know uh proper broadcasting needs to pay some bills here and you guys need to listen to some great advertisements. So Oh, yeah, let's get some stuff. Hey, want to get the best deals possible on preparedness items locally and online? Check out the American Preppers Network Buyers Club membership, APN Gold. APN Gold members get exclusive benefits, including access to discounts and specials to the best preparedness stores on the web. Save big by getting APN Gold today. Online at apngold.com or dial 1234-JOIN-APN. That's 1234-JOIN-APN or apngold.com. Lee Stack here for Powerful Products, your source for ready-made, easy-to-prepare, long-term food storage. Stock your shelves with the best of both worlds, food you eat every day and food for the unexpected emergencies. For your emergency and 72-hour food storage, visit PowerfulProducts.com. For your three-month, six-month, or year supply of food storage, visit PowerfulProducts.com. And now, with an affordable pay-as-you-go monthly food storage program, visit PowerfulProducts.com. Powerful Products, power your life. Listen up, folks. Obadiah's Wood Stoves. This company is from Montana, not China. And if you need a quality wood stove, cook stove, gas stove, fireplace, pellet stove, furnace, oil stove, and there's more at woodstoves.net. I've checked out their site at woodstoves.net, and I know what they have, and it's quality. They have how-to, YouTubes, and service parts. They provide a our word is our bond type service. They are an A-plus accredited business and have been in business since 1980. If you burn it, they have it. Check them out at woodstoves.net. And we're back, hey. right? Yes, <laughs> this, this whole live thing's freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> I know that so, nervous, you're doing good. You're doing good. And uh, we got some pictures posted. Some of these guys on chat, I was able to jump on. They're posting up some pictures. Did you? I don't know if you were on there, Nick. Did you see that motorcycle? Uh, let's see. It's the one that G-Man Prepper put up. Yeah. Oh yeah. man, I want to go ride around that. And I don't mini bike around my neighborhood. And see what my <laughs> it looks like a lonely ride, ride though. There won't be no ride. girl hanging on to you. Uh, you What's know, that? I'm married. I don't got to worry about that now. She can't get rid of me. <laughs> She's used to me pulling that kind of stuff. I had a motorcycle just like that growing up. I just see me on that thing riding around the neighborhood. My kids would absolutely go nuts over that thing. So that would be a blast. So um, yeah, oh, yeah. I definitely want to do that. Oh, how neat. So let's get into some other types of alternative energies besides gasification. Um, I think you've done a pretty good job of explaining that. And there's so many uses for it. I didn't know mm-hmm. that. So now I want to go build one of these things. And I know I want you to touch on this because one of the only things I've done to produce energy is I've taken my yard clippings and produced methane, basically. So uh, built a couple of barrels, put them out in the heat, um, put another one upside down on it, and when it fills up, it's filled up with methane. So what is that called, and and what do you know about it, Nick? Because I know you're the energy guy. That, my friend, is called anaerobic digestion. And it is a smelly way, it's the biological way to do gasification. What we're using in mechanical means and heat by burning in a gasifier, uh, that is all passed over. That job is passed on to bacteria, a special type of bacteria that gets its oxygen out of the water instead of out of the air. So that is anaerobic digestion. In fact, I have an anaerobic digester at my rabbitry. 
it's been cannibalized since I don't have as many rabbits anymore uh, because I'm kind of a projects man, and I do that from time to time and just gut (laughs) old projects to make new ones. I was Um, in that old rabbitry. I'll 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 testify to the fact that it was cannibalized a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, once I I pulled the rabbits out of it, there really wasn't uh, much use for uh, being able to remove 400 pounds of rabbit poop a day. (laughs) Um, At one point, I was producing 700 rabbits a month, which is about 3,500 pounds of food, and uh, I had this place rocking. It was was awesome. The production was good. Uh, The manure was moving right, and uh, I had a 5,500-gallon-an-hour pump that would drain my sump in about, uh, let's say, I think it was about 15 to 20 seconds. It would drain 55 gallons, and if that. But that pump would shove all of the manure and water that I used for cleaning out and into full sump system. I had to have three 275-gallon totes out in the back of the shed that were against the west wall, so it wasn't too hot, but it was it was warm. And each one of those would alternate. It would go would fill up at the top and then drain out of the bottom and fill up into the top of the next one, and then drain to the bottom and fill to the top of the next one. Uh, And that was how you slowly moved the manure through the system. And as it sat in there and it fermented in an oxygen-free environment, uh, the little critters in there would produce the the methane uh, in pretty large scales. Now, I had a 55-gallon drum filled full of water and a 30-gallon drum empty upside down in the water. And I had a hose connecting a manifold that connected all three of the 275-gallon totes. And basically, as they produced methane, the methane would rise, come out of the manifold into the hose and fill up the 30-gallon the 30 gallon, um barrel that was inside of the 55 gallon drum full of water and as that thing would fill up the idea was to have a sensor at the top and a sensor at the bottom so that as it filled up with uh, methane it would hit one sensor that would allow a compressor to turn on and compress the methane into a, a high pressure tank and then when it hit the second compressor the or excuse me the second switch it would shut off so I wouldn't start compressing water into that tank. Well, I never got as far as to put the sensors in or to put in uh, the compressor because I was having way too much fun with uh, 30 gallons of methane. I had yeah, a hose that came now, off of it. I did the same thing. I was using the 55-gallon big blue drums, and I'd have uh-huh. it upside down, and on the top of that thing I had a little PVC valve, basically, and I would just pump that out, and you'd turn that on, and the weight of the, the tank would push the, the methane out, and it would make a hell of a torch. You know, and I, I did it because I didn't know what I was doing. I thought it was just fun, and I had all these clippings. And I was thinking at one point I would be able to run the pump from the aquaponic system off of it. But uh-huh. I never figured out how to do that because then I have to convert and do all that fun stuff. So it was just fun using a blowtorch. Well, yeah. It, well, basically what I was doing was just burning it off a little bit at a time until one day I accidentally leaned on the 30-gallon tank and pushed it down and increased the pressure and a flame about 10 foot large just right away from my face. <laughs> After I cleaned my shorts, uh, I found out that it was a lot more fun than trying to compress it. So uh, I'd go out there and, and blast a 10 to 20 foot flame off of the sink for about three minutes. Uh, pretty hot, pretty awesome. Uh, so that was one way to get rid of the 300 to 400 pounds of rabbit manure I was producing a day. Nice. So would that actually digest all of the rabbit manure for you? I mean, how much waste were you looking at when you were done? Well, and that's what's great about it is it wasn't really any waste because the next product was a slurry that was digested and broke down and perfect to be dried out and used right into the compost. It's, it, it's a fast compost system. It's a high-heat composter. And, right. uh, I mean, and we live I in Arizona. Able... You'd think everybody with a septic system should have one of these things because, frankly, it's oh, exactly what it is. It's a septic system with a pipe sticking out of it that could power something. Yeah, and that's 
I think everybody everywhere, anybody who's got a septic system, that's the thing is when uh, bacteria eat, they emit heat. So it warms up. Uh, it's a, heat is a catalyst in, in creating the methane. And honestly, every time I drive down the road and I smell a, a, a sewage plant, and I can smell how gross it is. I'm like, man, those guys are losing fuel. And I'm thinking, I need to sign up and teach them how to do this right. But then I'd have to work at a poop plant, and it's bad enough being a mass murderer, cute and fluffy. I don't need poop engineer on my de- on my title either. So, yeah, that's anaerobic digestion. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I you know I, I I don't see a whole lot of questions here on the chat other than the answer to the test question, which I don't know that one. So, um, yeah, the answer to the test guys question. To call and comment. So, uh, what else you got, Nick? What other kind of fun you know activities that we can do with probably things laying around the house? Well, there are a number of things. Uh, one of the things that that really caught my attention for a long time was uh, electrolysis. Now, I'm going to start by telling you that electrolysis doesn't actually work, as in doesn't power engines by itself. It's not efficient because the amount of energy it takes to to complete the task uh, does not um, equal... It doesn't result in a, in a whole lot of extra. It, there's, yeah, there's no, there's no positive to it. Like, it consumes energy on both ends. So... Well, and, you know, let, if we get back into the fundamentals of producing energy for anything here, um, I mean, one of the bases is you can't, you know, destroy or create energy. You've got to find it from something else. So yeah, their energy the can only be transferred. Motion won't work. Right. So we, we've got to figure out something to do that. And I, I know your point with, with, with what you're saying. It's just you're putting too much in to get anything really worthwhile out to this point. I've seen some of yeah. them, you know, where people hook these hydrogen uh, producers up to cars and run it off the battery, and it pretty, but it's such a small amount. And I've, I've looked at all these studies, and I just can't find anything that's really worthwhile hooking up to my car that's going to give me 50% more gas mileage or anything. Frankly, yeah, I'd rather only... buy an old pickup truck, throw it in the ba- throw a wood burning stove and gasifier in the back of it, and drive down the road when I run out of gas. Um, because yeah, I've that got is, enough scraps laying around to do it from the rabbits and everything else. That's that's exactly right. And the reason, like, I don't know if you guys know my story, but uh, I started with five rabbits. I had a male and four females, and the reason I got them was because I could plan on their moisture content of their manure to be 20% or 16 to 20%, and the, I knew their density, I knew the weight, I knew volume, all of those things, and you can build a gasifier that is um, designed to run on rabbit manure. Uh, And basically, in my studies, I found that about 11 pounds of rabbit manure, which is two three-quarter five-gallon buckets, three-quarters full five-gallon buckets equals about 11 pounds of rabbit manure at 20% moisture content, that amount would run uh, a little air pump uh, the, or excuse me, the, an air compressor, a 5.5 horse engine for the same amount of time that a gallon of gasoline would. So I could replace a gallon of gasoline with 11 pounds of rabbit manure. Now, I don't know the technical terms and the transfer rates and the and how to do all of that math. I'm just a redneck in my garage playing with poop. So get that image out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for sticking it there. Well, and, you that? know, you got the added benefit. You get to eat the meat, too. Oh, exactly. And what was funny is the first few months that I had the rabbits, I was doing all these experiments and didn't realize that I I didn't plan on having four females and a male. I was planning on having five females. So we've got this community cage that all of a sudden, holy crap, where do these baby rabbits come from? And holy crap, <laughs> there's a bunch more baby rabbits. And, you know, pretty soon it was uh, – I mean, each female rabbit gives you 64 babies a year, so each litter is is 8 to 10 babies. I had, oh, shoot, in that first couple months, I had 40 baby rabbits, and I was like, holy cow, i got to figure out a way to figure out a way to get rid of these rabbits, and found out that there was a market for them on Facebook or on, on Craigslist, and, and I could eat them, and it, it was just pretty funny. 
So I, I do have one other question. So what are you, you know, you're talking about 11 pounds of rabbit manure. What is that equal in feed and what is it costing you? Because it, that sounds like a lot of rabbit manure when I can go out and get a gallon of gas for $3.50 right now. now I know that's going to change. We all know that. But what does it cost you to produce that 11 pounds of rabbit manure? Have you done the math on it? Yes. And uh, so a rabbit consumes four ounces of dry food a day. And he poops about three ounces by weight a day. So four ounces in, three ounces out. The volume of that poop is just over five ounces. And I wish that we didn't have ounces and ounces as weight and volume measurements for this. And actually what I wish is I would have done it in the metric system so that I could actually explain this to people across the seas. Uh, and to the north of us, I believe Canada uses metric. But um, basically, the the volume and the and the uh, the weight were very similar. They're just off by about an ounce. But um, so there is some waste that goes away in the urine. But right for 11 pounds, divide that by or excuse me, times 11 pounds uh, four times is uh, 44. Divide that by uh, three ounces, three goes into 44, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but you, you get the point. It's about right. 10 rabbits per gallon. Okay, roughly. that's what I'm looking for. And, and you're, 10 to, 10 to 12 know. rabbits to produce a gallon of, of gasoline power. So basically I can do the same thing with barley in a fodder system, throw it in there, get it down to however many, you know, I can take my 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 50-pound bag of barley, create 600 pounds of, or 300 pounds of food, feed it to uh-huh. my rabbits, take that poop, gasify it, and, and, and eat the meat and power my home. Exactly. The idea, the, the reason and, um, the reason that you combine the rabbits and the gasification is you also we're working on a way to um, recycle the urine and put that back into aquaponics to give you more growing power. Uh, right. With those with those things combined, you have rabbits, uh, fish, and vegetables being grown on the same cycle. And with um, the input of black soldier flies, you could also have the quail and the fish eating a high protein. So you could have three meat sources, all your vegetables and fruits that you need, and power all in the same loop. So that's pretty phenomenal. And that's where we're headed. That's that's what we're working on. That's what we're trying to get to. That's what we grow ours. I mean, that's Nick and I. This was our first thing um, that we got together to do was create this hop system that does this. So for anybody out there listening, I mean, we're, we're trying this stuff out. We're putting together our little systems. We're working really hard on getting this going. Um, I've learned all about rabbits from Nick. I know he's picked up some things about aquaponics from me, and we're we're working on this. I know next week, Nick, we're having somebody on uh, talking about distillate, uh, distilling. Um, yes. And I'm really looking forward to that, too. So, you know, you throw that into the loop, and now you're making alcohol that you can burn. And, uh, I mean, when we're going to find out about this next week, but he's talking about we can dump this right into the fuel tank of almost any car out there today with basically a 50-50 mixture and some mm-hmm. of them even run 100% on it. So we're even up in the game one more at that point. And you're picking up one of those stills, aren't you? Oh, yeah. I I talked with them, and we might be trading some, some bunnies and cages for a still. Uh, I don't know if that's going to go through or not. He acted like he was interested, so we'll see if we can do a little barter shop in here. Absolutely. Um, that's but, what it's about. So. And I've actually you – know, that's another thing we could talk about is, is the, the distillation of alcohol. I actually made – uh, made alcohol out of grass clippings as, as one of the experiments. I, I actually, we used to run a biodiesel refinery using used vegetable oil, and I was spending a bunch of money on on methanol or methyl alcohol, wood wood alcohol, uh, which is a little bit. It's not the same stuff as what you drink, but uh, you can um, ferment pretty much any biomass. Uh with the with the wood alcohol you you uh, mix acids in with it to break the cellulose down into starches and then you ferment the starches. And with that you you're getting methanol. And I was producing it trying to trying to get the the right mixtures and whatnot and 
And unless I went on a very large scale, it was going to cost me about $3 a gallon to produce methanol. So I left it alone. It was one of those abandoned deals. But then talking with this gentleman about distillation of alcohol, uh, $30 per hundredweight sounded pretty dang good. What that means is it was costing $30 for 100 uh, for 100 pounds of uh, feedstock, and then you're basically right. producing alcohol for under a buck, a pound, uh, under a buck a gallon, roughly. I love it. Yeah. Uh, see, I'm 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 gonna keep re- <laughs> Well, I've got a different issue. I want to do with that still. But, uh, that's yeah, it. you're you're looking to feed your drinking problem. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, selling some moonshine, right? No, I, I, again, uh, for anybody listening is in the NSA, Nick's email address is nickacostalhair.com. Feel free to go straight to him. I have nothing to do with any of this. So with that uh, out of the uh, Nick, we have, <laughs> we have uh, another couple of things. We've got about a little over uh, about 10, 15 minutes left. So I want to get to the plug of the week and get that out of the way right now. So what do we got this week? The plug of the week is? Yep. Uh, drum roll, please. Where did it go? <laughs> Gosh, dang it. You All right, it is stuff, the right? Arizona Survivalist Slash Prepper Expos. Now, this, these expos, this was the first one I went to, uh, the first one that I, uh, that I had the privilege of being a part of. It was put on by Lance Baker. And I called up old Lance Baker and I said, I want to be a vendor at your expo. He's like, okay, what do you sell? I sell rabbits. <laughs> he said, well, there's an awkward pause there. He's like, okay, and that has to do with prepping how? <laughs> and so I went, I went into the description of uh, of how rabbits are really the perfect survival uh, the the perfect survival feed or food because. They're really high in protein. They take very little space. They're very efficient on the food that they eat. And for all of you out there that are going to immediately ask, well, what about rabbit starvation? Uh, Farmed rabbit has a higher uh, fat content than wild rabbit, so you don't have to worry about that. And if you're in a situation where you need to have more uh, fat in your diet, uh, you can easily use the brain and some of the intestines in a stew and kind of a broth and get all of the good cholesterol out of that. So you can use rabbits and survive off of them without getting protein poisoning. So anyway, I'm complaining with, uh, what's that? When is that expo? Oh, his next expo is in, uh, it's in May, the end of May, first part of June. It's May 31st and, um, June 1st. And it is in Prescott, actually Prescott Valley, Arizona, at Tim's Toyota Center. Uh, big, that was a is that Tim's Toyota Center. What's that? That's a big. It's a big venue too. We got to meet some really cool people. We were at a prepper fest this last week, and I, I didn't have a booth. I was out there helping Nick out. We were uh, talking about the Homestead Conference coming up April fifth and sixth, and you know we're out there and getting to meet these people. Uh, the the prep professor amazing um all of them around here they do a wonderful job but lance is just he puts on an amazing show and if you guys are looking to get out of the valley and you want to you, you got to get up to uh to the great hardware store up there and tractor supply is right there go to tim's toyota center man that place is great he puts on an awesome expo um, I have so much fun at, at that expo, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to have a booth at this one rather than just hang around next booth. But. Oh, that's okay, Don. You can hang out in my booth. You do okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm learning a lot about rabbits, so, you know, that's, that's one good thing that comes out of it. So so that's the plug of the week is Lance's show up there coming up in um, June, you said? Yeah, that's it's uh, last day in May, first day in June, so 31st and 1st. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to also go out there and say, guys, it's coming up to the deadline. If you're anywhere near Arizona, April 5th and 6th, homesteadconference.com. That is a We Grow Waters Presents type thing. We're going to have eight awesome teachers, uh, well, six awesome teachers, and then Nick and I. And we're going to be talking about all sorts of fun stuff up there. So tickets are on sale right now. 
there was a ten dollar is it a ten dollar off or a ten percent off your it's ten ticket it's at, ten dollar ten dollar yeah. uh, coupon code and you guys can go either EcoPie Gardens, Hostel Hair, Facebook, uh, any of those websites from any of our teachers and get that coupon code. So make sure that we're going out and doing that too because I can't wait to meet you guys there. It's going to be a, a fun weekend and I can't wait to learn some of the stuff. So oh yeah, like I'm going to be teaching just rabbits there, and I'm looking forward to that. Justin Rohner is going to be amazing. He's his yeah. classes are usually like three hundred bucks a piece. And yeah. uh, he's really he's he's really helping us out by coming on. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm trying to get the site entered in here. Conference. <laughs> can't freaking spell. <laughs> this is why we okay. do shows, by the way. <laughs> exactly. I'm sitting here pecking away with my one finger, one on the phone. Oh my gosh, I need to start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the guy who can tell you still. Uh, he's going to yeah. be on next week, so we're going to talk to him about getting you drinking. <laughs> yes. You're crazy yes. enough without drinking, and I'd, I'd be a little scared if you. If you were I know, right? Drinking. That's the. Exactly. I would be. Uh, I I don't know. I'm, I'm crazy enough without the alcohol. I, I yeah. Well, we'll leave it at that. I don't need any yeah, and chemical I don't think help. Yeah, you'd ever be able to drink. If you had all that alcohol, you'd just be out there setting it on fire and trying to run something with it. So. Yeah. Oh man. So uh, all right. So back to the alternative energies. So we we've talked about the digestion systems and basically the septic systems, the gasifiers. What about hydro? Have you done anything with hydro? Well, hydro is pretty simple. Uh, if you've got a if you've got a downhill water source, uh, all you have to do is start with a large opening pipe and neck it down little by little. Make sure that you're screening off the first part of the pipe because you don't want any obstructions to drop into your pipe. Uh, neck it down until you've built up pressure, and then at the bottom of the of your hill or where you want your power source, you go ahead and put in a generator, uh, you could use an alternator that's hooked up to an impeller and just spin it off of there. There's there's a pretty cool design that uses a five gallon bucket and uh I believe it's a I believe it's a fan that they use for blowing up the those those big jump houses and it, right. the water goes through it and spins the spins a a shaft that then spins the alternator. You can use if you're looking for DC current, you can use uh, oh a treadmill well, that alternator motor. Alternator is DC current. What's that? The alternator is DC current. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, if you're looking for uh, AC current, you use a uh, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, you just use an inverter. Everything everything generates <laughs> DC easier. Just get a DC and then get an inverter if you want to run something straight like that. Yeah, you know, um, get into that whole power thing again, and you're trying to your voltages, and and you're going to lose efficiency when you convert anything from DC to AC or vice versa. So inverters yes. are actually losing powers. Um, so you are, but if you're you getting it free oh, off the hillside, you know. Good, good point. I, I wonder if we've got anything in Arizona we can utilize water for. You know, basically during during rainy seasons, you just bring it down to your gutter and and charge up some batteries with it. For goodness sakes, because we well, we get five inches of rain when it does rain, which it hasn't forever. But we get five inches of rain in two hours, and then we got nothing. So, I guess Arizona probably isn't the best place to talk about hydro. But you know, I'd yeah, love to well, that's some way to run my aquaponics pump off of it. Well, that's kind of like trying to harness lightning, though. I mean, that's a whole yeah. lot of charge in one shot. Um, and if you're going to use it, like if you've got a wash going through your through your uh, farm or your land and you want to harness that power of the water rushing by, the best thing I could tell you to do is, um, and it's called an earth battery or a gravity battery, where it's basically a shaft that has a bucket full of concrete on it that drops down into a hole as deep as you can dig. Uh, and what happens is as as you gear it to where the, the hydro power spins the, or, or if anything spins that shaft, it lifts the buckets up, and then you gear the shaft uh, so that as the buckets fall into the hole, it causes your generator to turn. In fact, 
why don't I go ahead and do this? I'm going to tell you guys to go to a page that I haven't really published yet. It's called Hostile Power. Uh, so Facebook.com backslash Hostile Power. I'm going to enter that in here and see if that takes you to it. Or just search for Hostile Power. I actually have that. Um, I have that up and and displayed because I thought it was pretty cool. And I was just using that page to kind of hold the spot. I was thinking that uh, I was going to start producing gasifiers or parts for them. And they're just, we've got so many projects going on right now. The rabbits are really taking, hey, there we go, webmaster. Thank you much. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's not, it's something that I've got on the back burner, but it's definitely my, my one true love, if you will. It's my go-to uh, it's it's my go-to when I'm when I don't have anything going on. But of late, I've always had stuff going on, so I haven't been able to focus on alternative power for a long time. Um, yeah. So, so I might have to it. start doing it now. What's that? I said we talk about it enough. We get we do have to start doing it. Yeah, I mean that's I say when things start settling down, but the reality is it's never going to settle down. We just got to get going, you know. Got to do it. Yeah, no, I hear you. Just do it, right? All right. <laughs> yeah, let's just get it done. So <laughs> what else do we got? Um, we're running up on about five minutes left, and I haven't been on the chat here too much, but we got any questions out there on the chat that you've seen? I know they uh, some of you mentioned something about the colony. Have you seen that gas fire that's on the colony? The gas fire on the colony, No. Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen that either. And I also saw yeah, a question I, on there about biodiesel. And I think we could probably spend the whole show talking about just biodiesel. And I know we're going to be talking about biodiesel. We're going to have some people on. But I do want to talk about some of the little power that I do know, and that is converting algae to biodiesel. And that's part of the yeah. aquaponics. We're actually growing algae. Um, if, you're, if you're into aquaponics, you know algae grows well, I was doing a duckweed tank and ended up turning that into a um, – my duckweed drained out, long story. I ended up with a bunch of algae in there and worked with one of the guys here locally and found out I can turn that into biodiesel and throw it right into the diesel. Absolutely an opportunity for biodiesel and aquaponics and algae. And biodiesel can run on uh, – I mean, there's a ton of people out there doing biodiesel. So rather than me talking about how that whole process is, I'm going to defer to the expert when we have them on. So I believe – look about uh, probably three, ra- three, uh, three weeks or so we're going to do a biodiesel show. So, um, But, but that, that's an absolute awesome energy source for anybody is biodiesel. And it's plentiful. It's easy to do. Scott Yarish is big into biodiesel and creates his own right now. I don't know if you know that, Nick. He, he well, runs I, his truck mostly on biodiesel. Yeah, I I thought that he went to Arizona Biodiesel to get his. I I didn't see any of his refinery stuff unless it's in his garage. Yeah, he was so. talking about making it and everything. So, and um, looks like Solar Prepper. Thank you for that link on the colony. I'm going to definitely take a look at that. Um, they, they talk about a, a basic gasifier. He posted a YouTube video on that. So I'm going to get that link out on wegrowars.com. So I, we've got about two minutes left, Nick. What else you got? Yeah. That's pretty much it. I mean, the rest would just be senseless uh, ramblings. So we'll talk the, the conference major. Uh, this, we're coming up on it. We're about we're less than two weeks away. So purchase your tickets. Get down here. Get your grow on, you know, learn how to do stuff with stuff. <laughs> so, learn how to do stuff. You're such good at advertising. It's so good at advertising. You know, you know, yeah, we can't, I, the only thing I, I don't I am like such good at advertising. Show, I can't put all these uh, screw-ups out on our clip, on our reel at the very end of the show that I normally do. So. <laughs> yeah, so well, we they're, they're, you'll, have to, you'll have to listen to them live, I guess. Yeah, at least we haven't made any really big slips this time like we have in the past in the studio. So, yeah, I didn't I didn't drop any uh, f bombs, so we're good. <laughs> so thank you everybody for tuning in and listening. Right, I guess we're losing Don, so thanks guys.
Today's broadcast has come to you through the courtesy of the Prepper Broadcasting Network. See our hosts, show schedules, archive programs, and more at PrepperBroadcasting.com. Thanks for listening.